Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come to this wonderful place to, uh, to talk to you about um, non-magnetic solar system bodies and the, some of the plasma measurements that, uh, that were made. So the images just shows just some hints of, um, of those bodies. Uh, so obviously we have comets, uh, there's Mars, there's Venus, there's Titan, uh, which is inside Saturn's magnetosphere. There's also Enceladus here as well. And just to stress, you know, um, the, uh, I've been fortunate to be in this field only 30 years, you know, compared to some of the people here, but I've uh, uh, but, um, uh, been involved in the Giotto JPA team, the Cassini CAPS team, um, and also the Mars and Venus Express ASPRA teams. So um, the measurements are, are from, those, um, from those instruments. So um, uh, I'll start off really with um, uh, just an outline of the talk. So we're going to talk about um, the non-magnetic objects in the solar system a little bit, um, the interaction, of course, um, the upstream conditions play an important role, uh, the, the state of the object or the type of object, or whether it has an atmosphere or not, is very important. Um, and I'm going to concentrate really on three common processes throughout, throughout these um, objects. It's impossible to cover everything, but iron pickup, um, some ionospheric processes uh, when we have an atmosphere, in particular ionospheric photoelectrons, uh, which of course we've heard a lot about in the, in the Earth's environment, um, and also plasma escape. So we're really going to sort of concentrate on those areas. So just to start off with, um, th this is a slide which compares the, the magnetic objects in the solar system, um, which uh, uh, this, this was done with by Russell and Walker, um, sort of going up in size here. So here's the Earth and um, uh, going up in size, size towards Uranus, and Neptune, Saturn and Jupiter, um, down in size to Mercury. And then on the same scale as the Earth here, here's the Venus interaction, the Mars interaction, the Pluto interaction. What's being plotted here is the bow shock. So all of these objects have bow shocks um, and uh, Pluto, that presumably is variable as Pluto goes around um, in its orbit, the atmosphere changes. And comets, comets are on a similar scale to perhaps uh, Uranus and Neptune. Um, this is the production rate ratio changing here. Um, this is Halley, Comet Halley, if we call that 100 in terms of the production rate. Um, and then uh, Jacobini Zinner here, another uh, a comet visited by a spacecraft. And then Griggs Scheler up and, and, and um, uh, Comet Borrelly, um, which were uh, which give those um, those types of rates. Um, and so that the uh, actually this, this is probably the wrong way around because Borrelly actually is more like Jacobini's inner, I think, in the in the production. But um, uh, so here is um, this gives you an idea uh, again with the comets how the bow shock position changes with the production rate, and with the comets as well the the um, uh, the we have iron pickup going on um, throughout the region here and including in the bow shock and that causes significant difference with, with, with the bow shocks um, and uh, we've mentioned that very briefly. So Venus and Mars, um, so of course Venus, although it's very uh, just only slightly smaller than the Earth, the bow shock much smaller because the, the interaction is directly uh, with, with um, v the Venus ionosphere and then Mars um, is on, uh, unmagnetized on the broad scale but, um, of course, it has crustal magnetic fields, and um, that has some effect. So just to summarize, and this is very busy, gets very busy now, but this is the, uh, the missions which have been measuring pickup ions in the last 30 years, the last 10 years, and then in the next 10 years. Um, so if we look um, at the, non the unmagnetized objects here on the right-hand side, so at Venus, of course, PVO and Venus Express, at Mars, um, these missions here, and of course MAVEN about to, um, uh, about to get there next, uh, or later, later this year. Uh, Pluto, New Horizons on the way there. Um, the Moon, all these wonderful um, missions which have shown some very interesting uh, effects at the Moon. We heard some of those um, yesterday a little bit. And then the Comets, uh, these are some of the missions here, and of course we're looking forward to Rosetta later this year, um, starting with to go with the Comet as, as Comet um, churyumov gerasimenko as that goes into the inner solar system um, so from, the, from the outer solar system. So as the activity develops and so on, it will uh, deploy a lander, but it also will, will measure the plasma environment um, of, of these comets. And so this is um, a, a summary of those missions. And of course, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, the moons here, so Cassini-Huygens and um, uh, uh, in the past, Galileo. In the future, JUICE will be looking at um, the, the moon interactions and possibly other missions as well. So this just gives you a sort of um, summary of the different, um, different, different missions where pickup ions have been measured. So it's impossible to go through all of these, but I will um, just uh, sort of 
draw out a couple of points. So first of all, the upstream conditions, of course, that changes in the solar wind as the solar wind, uh, as we, ch we change in position in the solar system. Um, and so here is the, um, uh, the, the beta and the Mach number going up as we go out in heliospheric distance here on a log scale. Um, so this is v uh, Venus, Mars, um, Jupiter and Saturn. And so these are, um, on the average, these are the, the Mach number and beta as we're as we going out in the solar system. Um, uh, under these assumptions. And of course, the impulsive um, changes in the solar wind mean that we have significant differences in the, um, uh, in the instantaneous solar wind conditions as, as we um, uh, actually measure at these objects. But um, uh, in the context of you know, expansion out into, uh, away, from, um, away from the sun. The other possible upstream condition is that these objects can be inside planetary magnetospheres. So this particular one is, um, is Saturn's magnetosphere. And of course, this is dominated by neutrals. Uh, so water group neutrals coming off the um, ice and, and um, uh, 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 icy particles in the inner, inner, inner region, uh, most of it from Enceladus. So this is a co-rotating magnetosphere, as we heard earlier. Um, and um, uh, on, on the broad scale, although there are breakdowns um, sort of further out in the magnetosphere, but a lot of iron pickup going on in the inner part of the magnetosphere and dominated really by water um, in that uh, inner region. The ion was dominated by water as well. Um, so, ge but generally, um, these, these objects, when they're in the magnetosphere, so Enceladus, for example, at four Saturn radii, which is producing a lot of this stuff, and not all of it, because some is coming from the rings and, um, and, and other uh, places, but Titan out here at 20 Saturn radii, most of the time inside the bow shock of, um, uh, uh, or in, inside the magnetopause of, of Saturn. Um, and generally, um, the moons are sort of engulfed in hotter and denser plasma than the solar wind. The actual conditions, again, highly variable. Um, so the nature of the obstacle plays a, plays a major role. So the, the this is from um, Janet Luhmann. Um, so if we have a, a, an atmosphere with an object, um, then this is uh, illustrating what happens. So the solar radiation uh, forming the um, ionization, which forms the ionosphere here. And then we have the, when you have the solar wind coming in, this forms a wake behind the object um, and starts interacting here. And you end up with an induced magnetosphere, which um, uh, this is um, what happens. And so the, the steps in the formation of an ionospheric plasma obstacle in a flowing magnet magnetized plasma. And so an object like Titan, for example, you might expect to, um, uh, to conform to that. But actually, Titan is slightly different. Um, this is the steps. Uh, this is um, uh, Titan. There's, there's no bow shock. There's additional ionization from magnetospheric electrons, particularly um, visible on the night side of Titan. But also, Titan is moving around, um, of course, as it goes in around in its orbit around Saturn. So the angle between the, the sunlight um, and then uh, the dark region, and then the co-rotating magnetospheric plasma flow, that changes as Titan goes around in its orbit. And so this gives you a very interesting um, experiment to be able to do at different local times around um, uh, in, in the orbit. Okay, so the upstream conditions are very important, um, but th so now we're going to look at some of the processes. So this is um, iron pickup, so probably everybody is familiar with this, but uh, we have the ionization of a newly born ion here um, from, um, from a neutral, and so uh, initially accelerated by the electric field, mi minus V cross B, and this gyrates then um, around the magnetic field, so you end up with a guiding center drift, E cross B over B squared, um, and so the newborn iron tra tra trajectory is out of this plane. So this is the trajectory in real space. So we have this cycloid motion um, in, in real space for um, the, the um, uh, pickup ions. If you look at it in velocity space, um, this uh, forms a, sh a ring um, in velocity space. So the, the cycloid uh, is a ring in velocity space here, and you can work out what the maximum energy of that is for the, for the ring. It will be four times the mass times the energy of the solar wind times the sine squared of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. And so you can work that out. And then the idea was um, you'd have scattering onto a shell, and so this is the velocity space picture here. Um, and you can transform that into the solar wind um, magnetic field aligned frame. Um, and uh, so this means that um, the velocity of the ring here, uh, this is the ring in velocity space along the magnetic field here is the ring, uh, this is the shell. Um, you would have um, uh, basically a, a V parallel. Um, uh, the V parallel is uh, the same as V dot B over B, but the V shell uh, would be zero, zero, zero. 
But actually, um, this is not quite what happens in ion pickup. It's, it's very slightly different. But if the cometary plasma environment, so as a, a cometary nucleus approaches the sun, the gas um, starts coming off, uh, subliming away into the system, um, and dust coming away as well. The neutrals drift away from the nucleus at about one kilometer per second. And then the production rate um, uh, varies with distance from the sun. So we get source terms like this. Um, so the ionization of the particles. So this can happen over large regions of space, and this is why we can get some uh, pickup ions upstream of the bow shock. So what do we see with the measurements? So this was from, um, uh, from the Giotto um, uh, spacecraft, and so this is from a million kilometers, or more than a million kilometers before closest approach, closest approach in the middle of the picture here, and then um, a million kilometers on, the, on this side again. So a bow shock does indeed appear. These, each of these are energy spectrograms, and it's going from um, 100 EV up to about um, uh, 100 keV. So that's the energy um, to be able to get the the peak of the pickup ion distribution. Actually, the Giotto sensor was the only one of the cometary Armada in, in the 80s which was able to actually see the water group ions um, and, and how they developed uh, the, all, the complete energy spectrum of those. This is the solar wind down here at less than, at less than 1 keV. You can see that slows down, then speeds up on the other side. And so this is the increase. There's already pickup ions upstream of the bow shock. We can see the increase um, uh, down, downstream of the bow shock and then the bifurcation here of the, um, of the spectrum. And so this bifurcation is due to the slowing of the flow. So because we have a bow shock, this, gi this gives you different populations which can be picked up, picked up from upstream and picked up locally. That explains this. And so th these um, uh, plasma observations were, were very important in, in trying to understand the pickup process and how that, um, how that happens. And so we analyzed these, um, uh, putting those, these into V-perp, V-parallel, so you can see well upstream of the shock here at four million, four million kilometers. The shock was about one million kilometers. You see the relatively narrow pitch angle distributions. Then as we approach the comet, these broaden out in, uh, in pitch angle uh, and also in energy. And so there's uh, acceleration processes as well as um, pitch angle scattering going on. And so this is thought to be the Fermi type uh, two mainly mechanism doing that, and so we, we were able to analyze that in detail. But we were able to look at this, um, and, um, and, and actually the, the simple shell picture is not quite right, um, and so uh, looking at um, uh, upstream and downstream propagating alphane waves, um, uh, we, we get a, a bispherical shell, and so we could work out that actually the bulk velocity of that moves along this axis this is for um, a supersonic solar wind, and so this is, this is happening in the supersonic solar wind, um, and so this is um, the bulk velocity is now zero zero and v bulk parallel, and actually we were able to see that in the data, which I won't dwell on, but this is the bispherical bulk speed as we're getting um, from very large distances, where the actual um, bulk velocity of the pickup ions is following the ring prediction, which is up here, but towards the comet, um, this is more of the biospherical bulk, bulk speed, and that is going uh, very nicely there. So we're able to confirm that in the data. So the biospherical shell uh, picture of ion pickup has been useful not only in looking at comets, but also in looking at interstellar um, uh, pickup and pickup in other environments as well. Okay, so very far from the sun, the idea is we have um, a relatively bare nucleus, and so when Rosetta, uh, well, Rosetta has switched on, and so when the instruments switch on um, shortly, um, it will be possible to look at um, uh, basically the interaction of a, a nucleus uh, with the solar wind coming in from the left, some pickup going on probably in the early, um, uh, in the early um, data. But closer to the sun, the more developed solar wind interaction with the various boundaries, and so we have the bow shock, which, as I say, is affected by the pickup ions. Um, the contact surface, which is um, where in, inside of that, the thermal pl plasma is dominating, um, and then the magnetic field draping and so on. So we should be able to see that um, with the Rosetta spacecraft. And so this activity onset is going to be very interesting to look at with the, uh, with the data. Okay, so uh, briefly with Mars, and so th here we have crustal magnetic fields, um, ion pickup going on on the large scale um, at Mars, uh, the interaction scale, um, uh, the, uh, an induced magnetosphere happening here as well. And so we have um, in the exosphere ionization and pickup going on. Uh, the gyro radius in this case is larger than that of the planet, so there are pot some particles which do this. There's a number of interesting um, things, so auroral emissions associated with the crustal magnetic fields. Um, uh, 
which, which is um, very interesting, but it's not dominating the, the interaction. The loss rate, early measures of the, of the uh, loss rate were, were, were um, uh, early, early measurements from Mars Express showed that, the, um, showed that uh, it was about one hundredth of, of what Phobos had measured, uh, but this is now being revised upwards. And so there are a number of different um, uh, estimates for the, um, for the uh, loss rate um, at, uh, at Mars. Now, some of that is, is pick up, but it's dominated actually by ionospheric escape down the tail. And so this is what um, uh, seems to happen. And in fact, the pickup is augmented, um, for example, by ambipolar outflow from ionospheric photoelectron escape. So we've argued this by uh, looking at the data. So this sounds like a polar wind type mechanism, mechanism at the Earth, which, be, which we've been talking about over the last couple of days. The crustal fields, there is an effect on the pressure balance. So Dave Brain had this uh, picture showing this, the sort of Martian obstacle presented to the solar wind. Venus, the gyro radius is smaller than the planetary radius. The pickup ions um, uh, were seen by PVO and now, now being seen by Venus Express. Uh, again, estimates of the, of the uh, escape rate here. Um, so Venus Express uh, is measuring about 10 to the 25, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 25 uh, per second via the tail. And so, again, a range of values which, which come out of that. And again, the ambipolar effect, um, so ionospheric photoelectrons being seen down the tail, this may actually um, extend, this may set up electric fields which then uh, contribute to the, um, to the ion escape. Uh, and in fact, that was seen. So Ruby, Rudy Fromm um, looked at the uh, ionospheric photoelectron spectra at Mars, the photoelectrons in the tail. So this is going all the way out to the um, uh, Mars Express apoapsis, which is um, three Martian radii away. And you can still see ionospheric photoelectrons in the tail. So this was a very interesting result. Uh, this shows where a uh, sort of um, schematic of where they are, so the ionospheric uh, photoelectrons are coming back here. So ionospheric plasma is, is out in the tail, and we're getting the pull, pulling out of, of plasma there. And so, so again, this is um, a photoelectron drawn escape, and this is a rough estimate of the, um, of the escape um, using, that, um, uh, using the fluxes. Uh, so the idea with Mars then, um, so iron pickup on the day side, uh, we can have the draped magnetic field, uh, which is, can produce a magnetic connection um, somewhere in the sunlit ionosphere. Mars Express can see fo the photoelectrons down the tail, and so we can have photoelectron drawn escape. And so this is seen in addition to ionospheric escape, um, uh, so which is dominating the escape going down the tail. Uh, in fact, this, this compared to simulations, and so um, uh, this simulation um, uh, showed that it is possible to have a magnetic connection back to the um, back to the day side ionosphere where the photoelectrons are produced, and then you you measure them uh, back in the tail, and so that's a reasonable idea. Okay, so um, a number of measurements of the escape, both at Mars and Venus, and so um, Fedorov et al. Um, looked at this, and so this is at Mars on the left hand side and at Venus on the right. This is protons at the top and m over q greater than 14 at the bottom. And so with the, with the protons, these are uh, seen escaping in this sort of region. Uh, so the heavy ions escaping down the tail. So this is part of the evidence for, um, for the um, sort of ionospheric escape down the tail. And at Venus, a uh, similar thing happening. So the protons here and then in the tail with the coverage which was possible with Venus Express. Um, one can again see an important escape channel there. So it's possible to orient these um, with the electric field, so minus V cross B, to, to see, um, so the electric field in that direction, so you can see that this organizes the escape, um, and so this is the M over Q greater than 14 escape being, being organized by the, um, uh, the velocity in the magnetic field. Okay, some recent results, so magnetic reconnection being seen in the, in the tail of Venus, um, so an unmagnetized object, but we're still getting um, magnetic reconnection there. A um, number of things, hot flow anomalies, um, so this is something which uh, a solar wind um, interaction with the, the bow shock. And then the escape rate um, seems to increase by about a factor two during a, a coronal uh, uh, interaction region and up to 100 times do it during, a, during a CME. And so there have been some measurements of that. So the effect of the solar wind and changes in, in the solar wind uh, on the escape rate. So on to um, briefly to, um, uh, to Saturn. And so the, the, these are the moons of Saturn, the orbital distances of those moons, and um, the radii of the objects, and where they are in terms of the magnetosphere. So the I is inner magnetosphere, M is middle magnetosphere, and then um, Titan usually in the outer magnetosphere, but sometimes in the sheath, um, and so on. And so 
of course, the star of the show at, um, uh, at Saturn really being the being Enceladus with um, with its active geysers discovered by the Cassini mission. Uh, but of course, Titan is playing an important role as well in the outer magnetosphere with some very interesting results there too. So just to start with Titan, so this is the case um, where we have an atmosphere, um, very thick ap uh, atmosphere, thick in the Earth's atmosphere at the surface, and then um, an ionosphere uh, above that, so the magnetic field draping. So nominally, these are the nominal conditions, um, so the distance towards, uh, the direction towards Saturn is there. Again, the co-rotating flow as Saturn's magnetosphere rotates around uh, and, um, would, not, uh, would the nominal lead be in that direction. So, um, so the V um, and the B give you the electric field again, so electric field pointing away from Saturn in the nominal case. And actually, it and, and so with that situation, we'd expect the, the pickup ions to be doing these sorts of trajectories. And indeed, those are seen, uh, but, um, but it doesn't dominate. Uh, and in fact, the, the magnetospheric conditions are sat at Saturn depend on the solar wind conditions. And so we have the, the bowl-shaped magneto disk. So when Saturn was ori oriented like this, the direction to the sun there, and we have the sort of pushing of the solar wind, which means that the current sheet is being um, uh, bulged up like this. And so Titan, of course, is out at 20 Saturn radii, so this affects um, the Saturn environment. And so we have to take into account um, the, the shape of the magneto disk when um, uh, when looking at exactly the orientation which we get. Um, so a number of different um, uh, studies have been done to look at the plasma environment at, um, at, at uh, Titan um, and to, to characterize those and then characterize the interaction. So the Titan plasma uh, interaction, so sub-magnetosonic, um, so there's no shock, um, but we have a number of things going on, photoelectron production, heavy hydrocarbons, the escape of the atmosphere, um, and lots of, um, lots of interesting work being done. Um, so one of the uh, things was, was to look at very complex um, positive and negative ions. So the positive ions on the left-hand side here um, uh, being, being produced by um, reactions involving sunlight and energetic particles in the atmosphere um, of, um, of, of Titan, and then uh, producing these, uh, these very complex structures, including... Um, including negative ions up to up to 10,000 and even 13,000 atomic mass units, so much heavier than the positive ions. We hadn't expected any negative ions at all at these altitudes, so this was really a surprising discovery. Also, um, we have escape going on. So escape of masses 1, 16, and 28. So we looked at that in a paper last year um, and um, uh, with, the, with the CAPS um, measurements down the tail and estimated the, est the escape rates of those relatively light ions. Um, and then, um, uh, so this is related to the production of aerosols, which then go down to the surface. Very briefly about the ionospheric plasma near, near uh, unmagnetized objects. This is photoelectrons. So photoelectrons, we see these at Titan in the tail, well downstream from Titan. So this is um, ionospheric photoelectrons being seen here. Again, a simulation showing that you can get a magnetic connection even back in the tail of Titan. And we have the sim a similar th thing going on at Venus. Uh, and also at Mars, where we can see the telltale structure, the signature of ionospheric photoelectrons, which we've been talking about, of course, the, the solar spectrum interacting with the, um, uh, with the, um, uh, with the, with the neutrals uh, there to produce ionization, which then gives you an electron of a particular energy. So these, um, these sh uh, shapes like that. Okay, very briefly about Enceladus. So, of course, we have the Enceladus atmosphere. We have the magnetic field draping and also the plasma draping. Uh, and this is a, a ring distribution of ions, um, possibly a shell um, being, being produced from the Enceladus um, pickup. So, very interesting. And this is not the only um, uh, effect which is happening at Enceladus. We also have charged dust, which is very interesting. So, um, Geraint Jones looked at that in 2009, Tom Hill uh, relatively recently in, in 2012, um, and looking at the amount of um, charged dust and, and uh, inferring uh, uh, things about ionization um, going on there. Okay, at Rhea, very briefly, <laughs> so we have a, a neutral atmosphere, um, but we also have pick-up ions, and so pick-up positive ions here, and also negative ions, and we can see those in the data, and that means that we can triangulate back 
to the surface and towards the, uh, the place where this atmosphere is. And so this was the discovery. We hadn't known that there, would, the, that there was a, an atmosphere of, um, of, of Rhea, but it turns out this is the case. And you can see that in the positive and the negative ions um, uh, back there. And a similar story at Dione. Io and the Jovian satellites. Um, again, we can come up with a biospherical shell type of um, argument there. Um, we have the JUICE mission, of course, coming um, to be uh, launched in 2022. This will be going to orbit um, Ganymede, but it will also, also do a couple of flybys of Europa, so in the Jupiter system to look at um, pickup processes and the interaction between the surface uh, and, the, um, uh, uh, and the environment. Um, very briefly about the moon, this is um, the reflected and backscattered ions at the moon um, being seen in the, um, in, in the data here from Kaguya. And then one can... Um, uh, one can interpret that in terms of the pickup iron um, uh, uh, type of story. So the classical pickup here, and then the self pickup. So basically, we have the reflection of the particles off the moon, the solar wind particles off the surface of the moon, uh, and means we can change the pickup um, uh, uh, environment like this. So we we can get pickup ions with higher energy than the classical pickup can give us. And so this is, uh, gives you an extra kick in the pickup process. Uh, Pluto, no time. Um, so uh, what I did actually was to collect together the loss rates for solar, the different solar system objects and to try and sort of group them. So this is looking at the production rate in particles per second. And just in Excel, putting these together with the, with the radius of the object. And actually, you can see patterns in this. So the planets turn up here. Um, the moons turn up here, and the comets turn up here. So comets, higher um, rates of, um, of pickup, um, and of course those are lower, um, those are lower uh, radius. The moons here, there's the odd excep exception and sort of a crossing between these two, but the 10 to the 25 that we were talking about um, the other day where the Earth and Mars uh, and uh, Venus roughly are is, is this sort of region. So this is quite interesting that it turns up on this, um, this type of... Uh, scheme. So this tells us is also something about the process. And so very uh, briefly finishing, so, to, so we talked about pickup, we talked about ionospheric processes, um, and we talked about escape, um, providing some interesting things. And just very quickly, an advert, which I'll just leave up there, about a conference which we're going to have at UCL later in this year. So 7th to 11th of July, this is the Alfane conference, where we'll be talking about the plasma interactions with solar system objects. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sorry, <too> much. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, too much. <laughs> okay, uh, time for a couple of questions. Do you have some more? The so whistle oh, stop, oh, whistle yeah. stop tour. That's all right. Yeah. Oh, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I think both I'm just really fascinated with the pickup stuff, and um, I wanted to ping you a little bit. What? If you imagine that same mechanism working in the Earth's ionosphere where the alphane speed is very much larger than either thermal speed or convection speed yeah. of the plasma, could you imagine uh, transverse, uh, you know, if you take that same little picture with your yeah. alphane speeds way up along the axes and... Yes, yeah, so I guess you'd, you'd end up with a situation a little bit like we had with the Jupiter situation, I guess, where, where um, yes, if you change the speeds, you can still get the tract and velocity space which the, the particles would follow. The, so the relaxation would be transverse to the magnetic field. And yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, so, so yes, that's an interesting thing to, to follow up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm glad that you came up with the same numbers <laughs> that I did for the, for the ion outflow escape rates at the terrestrial planets. Okay. It is a mystery why they are all in that range of 24 to 10 to 24 to 10 to the 26. Yeah. I, I, it's something that needs to be understood. Okay. Now, all I did actually was put, in fact, I didn't put the Earth on here, but, um, uh, but this is uh, just the unmagnetized objects. Um, but it's interesting to see that the Earth is, is in about this vicinity as well. That's, you know, from your talk the other day. Um, but... Um, uh, yes, the planets seem to fall in here, the moon seem to fall in here, and the comets seem to fall in here. So if you sort of take the broader view, um, then, um, uh, you know, the comets are sort of, uh, obviously, you can get higher rates and so on. So this is, this is a combination. The, the list of references is huge with this for, for, getting, the, um, for getting the estimates. Um, and so I didn't have time to show the tables which, uh, which went into this. But yes, remarkable that some patterns do, t do turn up. 
A very okay. brief comment and yeah. a very brief question. <laughs> uh, to somewhat re uh, reacting to Bob Strangeway, I think <laughs> that uh, Mars and Venus are similar because their ionospheric densities are similar. Mm -hmm. And most, uh, a lot of that escape is caused by that. Uh, the Alpha Conference that you are mm -hmm. advertising, mm -hmm. is that open or is it by invitation? Uh, no, it's open. So, so the, the, web, the website is there. So there will be invited talks, but there are also there's lots of room for contributed talks and posters as well. So this should be a really um, exciting conference in, in London in July, when we hope the weather will be better than it currently is. So, uh, um, but this is a, this is a hope. But anyway, this is the uh, the advert for the. Uh, for the